In this video and the next, we're going to be talking about uric acid and gout. And before we start talking about the gout, we really need to understand the source of uric acid in humans. And the primary source is from degradation of compounds called purines. When you talk about DNA and RNA, there's purines and pyrimidines. And the purines are adenine and guanine. And there's some other purines that you don't find in DNA. You might find a few of them in RNA. And it turns out that in humans, all purines are eventually degraded to uric acid, sometimes called urate, which is a metabolic dead end. So we're going to first talk about the A's, and then we'll get to the G's. So for the A's, we actually begin with this compound, adenosine monophosphate. And this enzyme here, 5' exonuclease, uses water to hydrolyze off this phosphate right here, which then leaves us with this compound called adenosine. Then adenosine deaminase uses water and essentially hydrolyzes off this amine, which it leaves as ammonia or the ammonium ion, and it replaces it with a carbonyl. That oxygen is from the water here. And this molecule is called inosine. And then this enzyme right here called nucleosidase hydrolyzes off this ribose, this 5-carbon sugar, and just leaves the nitrogenous base here, which is hypoxanthine. Now over here we have the Gs. So similar to AMP over here, we've got GMP, guanosine monophosphate. Again, our 5' exonuclease is going to trim off this phosphate with water, a hydrolysis reaction, and that leaves us with guanosine. And then the nucleosidase, the same enzyme we saw down here, is going to hydrolyze off the ribose, this 5-carbon sugar, and leave us with the nitrogenous base up here, which is guanine. Now these two pathways are about to converge with one another into this compound called xanthine. So guanine is converted into xanthine by guanine deaminase, which performs a similar reaction to adenosine deaminase. It's going to take this amine group right here, this NH2, and remove it using water as the ammonium ion. And then it replaces it with a double bond oxygen or carbonyl, which you can see right here. If you're confused looking at this, just know that the molecule of xanthine has been flipped around 180 degrees. So if you imagine the mirror image of this, it would fit more with this guanine structure up here. And then coming over here, hypoxanthine is converted to xanthine by the action of this enzyme called xanthine oxidase, which uses water and molecular oxygen in order to add a carbonyl right over here on this carbon between these two nitrogens. And you can see that represented over here in xanthine. Again, xanthine, the molecule, has been flipped over 180 degrees relative to hypoxanthine, just like it was with guanine in this pathway. And then finally, xanthine can be converted into uric acid by the action of xanthine oxidase. Xanthine oxidase, again, uses water and molecular oxygen to perform the oxidation and adds a carbonyl right here on this carbon between the two nitrogens of the five carbon ring. You can see that added over here. Again, uric acid has been flipped back to the original conformation that these other molecules were shown in. In most other organisms, uric acid is further broken down by other enzymes into some kind of waste product that's excreted normally in the feces. However, in humans, there are no additional enzymes, so uric acid is a metabolic dead end. So, why is that the case? Well, in other organisms that are able to degrade uric acid, they have an enzyme called urate oxidase, which is encoded by the UOX gene. So suppose right here this is the gene encoding urate oxidase. Well, it's then transcribed into corresponding mRNA. These blue regions are the exons, let's say, and the black regions in between are the introns. So the mRNA will be processed, it will be spliced and matured, and then eventually translated into a protein. Let's say this is urate oxidase. And then urate oxidase is free to catalyze its reaction, which is to oxidize uric acid into this compound called 5-hydroxyisourate. But this process does not occur in humans, and the obvious question is why. And there's three major reasons. 
Number one, if you look over here, somewhere in the introns, there's an aberrant splice site. And you can certainly go to databases and find the exact spot or spots where the aberrant splice sites are. But the point is, is that during normal mRNA processing and maturation, the introns must be spliced out. And if they're not, well then that mRNA is never going to be translated into a functional protein. So there's an aberrant splice site. Reasons two and three are nonsense mutations that occur at codons 33 and 187 in the UOX gene, which obviously means the mutations will be present in the mRNA at codons 33 and 187. And what is a nonsense mutation? A nonsense mutation is one where the mutation causes there to be an abnormal stop codon. And what do stop codons encode? Well, they don't code amino acids, they actually terminate the protein synthesis. So any way you look at it, this protein, if it were even made, is going to be non-functional. Now the fact that you have an aberrant splice site here is going to prevent translation and protein synthesis altogether regardless. However, even if this were not here, the fact that at codon number 33 there's a nonsense mutation and an abnormal stop codon, the translation would truncate prematurely significantly and so you end up with a very very short peptide that's certainly not going to function as a urate oxidase. So any way you look at it, humans do not make a functional urate oxidase and therefore this allows levels of uric acid to build up. Now because uric acid is a metabolic dead end, there still has to be a way to get rid of it, it's just not through metabolism, it's actually through elimination, whether through the kidneys or through the feces. But first of all, it's important to note that uric acid in humans actually functions as the most potent antioxidant in the blood. In most organisms, vitamin C or ascorbate is going to be the most potent antioxidant in the blood. However, in humans, a nice adaptation of this is we have higher levels of uric acid than most other organisms, and that uric acid can act as a scavenger of free radicals, antioxidants, etc. And so it's actually good to have some amount of this in the blood. It's more potent than vitamin C. But too much uric acid is bad and so excess uric acid is eliminated via the kidneys. So primarily renal elimination 70%, the other 30% is eliminated through the GI tract in feces. So right here you see a kidney tubule cell, part of the nephron, and over here uh, would actually be the filtrate and over on this side on the left would be the blood. And you can actually see there's several proteins here that are necessary for transporting uric acid um, from the basolateral side nearest the blood into the filtrate, so giving uric acid secretion. And those are MRP4, ABCG2, and NPT1, also goes by SLC17. A1. There's also a number of transporters that actually cause reabsorption of uric acid. There's actually a significant amount reabsorbed because it plays such an important role in the blood as an antioxidant. But you can end up with excessive uric acid in the blood. And that's called hyperuricemia. Hyperuricemia is simply elevated levels of serum uric acid. And the normal range for this in humans, it depends on the lab to be exact, but it's about 3.5 to 7.2 milligrams per deciliter of uric acid in the blood. Now here are some risk factors for developing hyperuricemia. Number one, a diet high in purines. And examples of foods that are high in purines are going to be organ meats like you see right here. There's a liver in the back. This looks like a heart in the front. Gamey meats, red meat, even some seafood is going to be high in purines. And alcohol. And this is especially true when the person is chronically dehydrated. It makes it even more likely to develop hyperuricemia when they're low on water. This can even be further exacerbated when the person's chronically in a catabolic state of metabolism. Number three, a diet high in sugar, especially fructose. This full-body Coca-Cola, one example, is loaded with high fructose corn syrup. That's going to predispose you to developing hyperuricemia. Simply being male and being older also increase your risk of developing hyperuricemia. And having mutations in any of these renal proteins that are involved in tubular secretion of uric acid also increase the likelihood of developing hyperuricemia. 
And then finally, chronic diseases such as diabetes mellitus, chronic kidney disease, both of these cause kidney damage. And if you damage the kidneys, you damage the ability to eliminate most of that uric acid, all predisposing someone to developing hyperuricemia. In the next video, we're going to continue talking about hyperuricemia and see how it can develop into gout. Hyperuricemia simply refers to the blood levels of uric acid, but what happens when those molecules of uric acid crystallize? Then we see gout or gouty arthritis. So make sure to join us in the next video. Thank you for all your support. Be sure to check out my Instagram for cool science and not science stuff.